So, what can we actually see with our ECG? Now, we, again, we could be studying a whole course on this, so we're just going to pick on some common or more common abnormalities that we can see that are reasonably easy to see within a trace. I mean, this is a whole discipline within itself, reading ECGs, and it's a profession within itself. You can get cardiologists, you can get cardiac nurses, cardiac technicians. So you can get very, very trained individuals whose only role is to read ECG. So we're just going to look at some, some fairly obvious um, traces and also some fairly common uh, abnormal abnormalities that we can see. So first one is what's referred to as an ectopic heartbeat. And these actually are quite common. Um, seem to be linked to disease states, um, things like smoking. It seems to be related to things like uh, some uh, diabetes, but also related to things like smoking, as I mentioned, and caffeine. Um, you get heart palpitations. So what can you see? Well, if you look very carefully, it's pretty striking. You've got an enormous sudden change in the electrical activity of the heart. Look at that sudden QRS innovation. Across the rest of them, if you look on the, on the far left and across the right, you can see pretty normal innovation of the heart. You can see a P QRS complex, we can see a T wave, we can even see a U wave. But this one in the middle is an unusual response. It's, it's an additional heartbeat that shouldn't be there. You know, the rest of them di dictate normal heartbeats. And these are these, these common responses that you see in individuals, for example, that have got um, 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 high caffeine intakes or, or a smokers or a di diabetics. So this is an ectopic heartbeat. And again, you wouldn't know this if you're using things like a polar heart rate monitor because of their sampling frequency. You wouldn't be able to see this by just taking the pulse of somebody. But people can f actually feel this. They can actually feel it. And you can perhaps feel it on the pulse of somebody. But you wouldn't know why you'd have to do the ECG. And we know that it's related to misfiring of the sinoatrial node. What about this one? Well, this is an interesting one. So here we've got what's referred to as a bundle branch block. Now, what the bundle branch block does, it's involved in um, the way in which the ventricles operate, the, the contraction and, and the relaxation. And we've got two views here. Again, it relates to the fact that the heart is a three-dimensional object. And because it's a three-dimensional object, we've got, in this example, an anterior and a lateral aspect view of the heart. And you can get both left bundle branch block and right bundle branch block. Okay, it's quite unusual to get both of them, but you, you can get both of them. And what you can see here is, is how it's been detected using two leads, which is V1 and V6, both anteriorly and laterally. And if you look at the signals, you can see quite clearly in lead V1 for right bundle branch block, look at what's happened to the T wave. The T wave has become, in, uh, become inverted. If you look on V6, then you can see that the, the T wave is, is, is actually quite highly raised. So this, this would tell a trained technician that there's probably some form of right bundle branch block. If you look on the right hand side of the panel, you can see the left bundle branch block. But look at the QRS complex for V1. It's inverted. So that's telling us there's quite clearly something going on within the ventricles because we would not expect to have a negative score for our QRS complex. Remember the QRS complex is where the, you get the, the biggest deep degree of innovation because you get the ejection of blood from the heart. So you wouldn't expect to get a, a, negative, a negative score. And V6, as with V1 for right bundle branch block, is now showing you a negative score. In other words, it's indicating that there has not been adequate repolarization of the ventricles. In other words, ventricles haven't been able to relax sufficiently prior to the start of the next um, beat of the heart. So these are quite common conditions, and they can be treated conditions. Very, very, very um, uncommon. Sorry, very rare, I should say, to get right and left bundle branch block together, but it does happen. Um, but they can be treated. But you can see how the ECG trace is able to identify this because, again, it links back to our knowledge of those structures of the heart. 
but what about athletes? <laughs> Most of the, what we've been dealing with really has been perhaps related more to clinical population groups or has been related to, to resting states. But the heart of, a, of an athlete, somebody like um, you know, the, um, Kip Chogi, who you know, is, is at the time of doing this podcast, is the world record holder for the marathon, the heart of an athlete is, is actually structurally, in terms of the, the structures, is the same, but actually its morphology and its functioning is quite different to that of a sedentary individual. And so the ECG has to be interpreted differently when we're dealing with an athlete's heart, because the heart, it's not that it works differently, it's just that it has been pushed in such a way that it will give different responses. Well, what do we know? Well, we know that physical conditioning, training, induces quite a large number of, of cardiovascular adaptations. So we know, for example, we get reduced resting heart rates. We get reduction in pressure. Um, we know stroke volume maximum goes up. We know cardiac output increases. But we also get an increase in cardiac mass. So the heart becomes bigger. And we also get an increase in the volume of the ventricles. And this is referred to as eccentric and concentric hypertrophy of the heart, something that we dealt with in podcast one. Remember that concentric hypertrophy of the heart is the thickening of the ventricle wall. Eccentric hypertrophy of the heart is the fact that the cavity, the ventricle itself, the intraventricular space, increases. The reason it increases is because more time passes to allow that blood to fill the heart. It's, it's more efficient for the heart to reject more blood per beat of the heart than beat more times pushing less blood out. So that is key, or they are two key adaptations that we see primarily in endurance-based athletes. So they tend to characterize what we refer to as an athletic heart. Um, as I say, mostly in endurance athletes, so you see this a lot in endurance cyclists, cross-country skiers, and marathon runners. So when we're looking at the ECG trace in this population group, we need to recognize that, this, that these adaptations may well have occurred. And what we need to think about is, how will these manifest themselves in the ECG trace? And what we know is the ones that have the greatest effect result in things like increased vagal tone, and we'll talk about vagal tone in a moment, um, and changes, significant changes in, in the mass of the heart and the volume of the heart. So if you think about it, if you've changed the mass and the volume of the heart, you're going to change the time over which the signal responds, let alone anything else, just the time because you've got a heart that can eject more blood per beat of the heart, so it can actually beat more slowly, because it can have a higher stroke volume per beat of the heart. So these things need to be considered when we're assessing the functioning of the athlete's heart. So this is from a fantastic position paper, which was in the British Journal of Sports Medicine, published in, in, uh, not long ago, in 2017. And what you can see is kind of a, 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 a flow diagram as, as to interpretation of normal and abnormal ECG findings in an athletic population group. And then the kind of bit in the middle, which are those borderline ones. So we know that normal findings would be, a response would be, you know, somebody who's trained, you'd expect to see an increase in QRS voltage. You'd expect that QRS complex to be higher because they've got a greater stroke volume. They can eject more blood per piece of the heart. You would expect to have an incomplete right bundle branch block. You certainly wouldn't expect them to have complete bundle branch, branch block. Um, ST elevation followed by T wave innovation, so if you think about the ST complex, um, you'd expect them to have some kind of bradycardia. So bradycardia is a reduced heart rate. You'd expect a lower heart rate. Um, may have some degree of arrhythmia with that as well. And this is again normally CG findings in well-trained athletes. However, what we do see in well-trained athletes are quite unusual responses. So for example, we see for example a T wave inversion. So rather than the T wave um, doing the, the kind of general rise, we see inverted, a bit like we saw in our bundle branch block uh, examples a moment ago. We might see, for example, uh, ST segment depression. So rather than having a, a, a standard ST response, the response becomes depressed. Now we're not explaining why these are happening, but these are, are abnormal ECG findings in an athletic population group. So what you would have to do is you would then look for these. So if, if there were two or more borderline findings, then you would have to do further evaluation. If it's just a one-off, then actually we don't need any more, any more evaluation and we're fine. So this is really useful because of the fact that the athlete's heart is so different 
to the heart of, of the non-athletic population group. So let's deal with bradycardia. Okay, so bradycardia is very common. The average resting heart rate for the general population is around about 70 beats per minute. In athletic population groups, we can see 40 beats per minute, even down to about 25 beats per minute at rest in highly trained athletes. So here we go, sinus rates in the range of 30 to 40 beats per minute. They're not uncommon in your, in your well-trained joint athletes. And why? Well, it's associated with what's called a sinus arrhythmia, which is a rhythmic change in the heart rate with respiration. So this is fascinating. So one of the things to, to recognize is, and what you have to do as a trained individual using ECGs, is be able to distinguish between what is the actual heart rate and what is the arrhythmia, which is in essence just the rhythmic change in the heart because of, of, of rhythmic change in respiration. You find that a lot of endurance athletes breathe, sorry, have a heart rate that responds to breathing rate. They tend to have exercise um, workloads, actually running cadences, for example, which respond to breathing rate and so on and so forth. So the sinus arrhythmia that we, we see in these individuals is mediated by atrial stretch receptors and they respond to the increase and decrease venous return during inspiration and expiration. So they speed up and slow down the heart respectively. So what happens is, as you breathe in and you breathe out, you change the amount of venous return that is going um, to the lung. Remember that we've talked um, previously that venous return is what in essence drives um, the, the, the respiration rate because it, dry, it brings in the CO2 to the lung. So you can understand how heart rate becomes really linked to this breathing rate, this, this, this response, so we get this sinus arrhythmia. And so the net result is that if they change their breathing frequency, the heart rate changes, because the two have this, this, this kind of almost symbiotic relationship. Now these aren't the best ECG traces in the world, but what you can see is um, a typical um, bradycardia in the top panel. So you can see each beat of the heart that's going on there. And if you imagine that each, each of those larger squares is probably a one second block, you can see the gap is, if we take the, the one here, so it's a one, a two, a three, a four, a five, a six second gap between each, each beat of the heart. But if you look below, you can see the arrhythmia. Can you see that sudden spike? So this arrhythmia is relating to when the breath is being, we get the inhalation and the exhalation. And so you can see the breathing pattern is being overlaid on top of the ECG trace. So what we would have is a trained technician who is able to di distinguish between what is an arrhythmia and what is some other kind of perhaps more insidious um, response in the ECG trace. We also mentioned though that the athletes and endurance athletes have increased mass and volume of the heart. So how do these manifest themselves within the ECG? Well, it tends to show up, not surprisingly, um, particularly with um, endurance athletes, if we think about that the volume of the heart has increased, it's going to change the QRS complex and the voltage. That's the total amount of electrical activity that occurs in order to generate the contraction of the ventricles. So one of the key things that we get is left ventricular hypertrophy, LVH, and what that tends to be associated with, increased U waves. Remember what we said, we said the T wave was the repolarization of the heart, but we said that the U wave was the final aspect of the repolarization of the heart. And so what we tend to see is in individuals who've got left ventricular hypertrophy is that the U wave comes into account because there has to be a greater degree of relaxation because there's been greater discharge of the heart, in other words, greater pressure has been induced to eject more blood per beat of the heart. So we get an elevated uh, U wave. We also get a down sloping of the ST segment um, with some degree of T wave inversion. Some degree of T wave inversion. So, gosh, these look quite messy, don't they? So if you look at the top panel, the top panel is, is showing us left ventricular hypertrophy. And you can see the U wave um, response. 
And you can see the U wave response quite clearly as is, as is highlighted on, on, on the graph. Now, in panel B, sorry, in panel B, you can see the U wave response. Um, in panel A, you can see the left ventricular hypertrophy. And you can see the, that U wave response, which is really quite um, accentuated. So, in other words, showing that kind of uh, additional phase of repolarization. But can you see um, how tricky it is now to, to, to look at these? And again, can you see the inverted T wave that we were referring to a moment ago?